All right. Uh, hopefully you can see it. It's a bit colorful, a bit cartoony, but I thought I would uh, take a different spin on this presentation. I know everybody's been doing a lot on kind of the technical stuff, but this was my very first machine learning challenge. So for a lot of you, it's going to be a going back in time just to show kind of the challenges that I had as a, a junior, an amateur in terms of the machine learning world and I decided to use Adventure Time if your kids watch it or if you're if you know that show because there were a lot of life philosophies as well as I was doing machine learning. So who am I? I'm Jeremy Zhao. I'm a process engineer with uh, 10 plus years in experience. I traveled before the pandemic and then the pandemic hit. So I spent 10 months in Australia during the pandemic and like I said I'm back home now in Canada. I live in Calgary, Alberta, where it can go from plus 20 to minus 20 in 24 hours, as we had experienced um, earlier in the month. And I've only been a data enthusiast for about a year, and I'm venturing into the startup world with kind of the knowledge and, and experience that I've seen uh, for a while. So the motivation, really, um, and this is Jake the dog, he sings a song about bacon pancakes and so basically what were the ingredients for why I entered into machine learning you know there was a pandemic happening probably a, a too early midlife crisis and the oil and gas industry is going through massive changes and I did a data-thon when I was in Australia virtually with the SPE uh, Calgary and untapped energy group here in Canada and that resulted in a lot of time because there was a lot of downtime as we all experienced during the pandemic for me just to explore experiment and try out machine learning and so some of my colleagues from that datathon that I referred to said hey there's this competition hosted by um, force you might be interested in and I said sure why not I've got tons of time and I'm not really doing anything during the the lockdown phases so um, so it was a really good time for me just to venture into machine learning. And so when I first started, I knew nothing about machine learning at all. And it was awesome that there was a starter notebook that was provided to us just to go through kind of the, the, the rudimentary steps on how to analyze the data, how to go through the data. And so I said, I've no idea what I'm doing and Jake here has a very good quote it says sucking at something is the first step to becoming sort of good at something so without any knowledge I just said hey why don't I just try to run this Jupyter notebook and submit it as is and the hilarious part was you know I got a better ranking the first time I submitted it than half the submission so I said hey I got past the first step in machine learning and this gave me more of the impetus or the motivation to continue trying. So, you know, this all seems very basic compared to what everybody else has presented, but it really showcases, I guess, what I had to go through in order to get to basically a top 10 spot, you know, and P Peter had talked about maybe there was a little bit of luck involved. Sure, but it, it really provided that motivation for me to keep going. So revisiting statistics after a while, right? Just doing basic things as I, you see in the figure here of just doing a log, you know, uh, distribution to understand, you know, the statistical spread of, of certain data that was presented to us. You know, I learned about outlier treatment. So, you know, just Googling or talking to some of my colleagues about, for example, limiting gamma ray. So I try to cap some of the numbers to treat some of the outliers, you know, log transforming as a, as a result of just visually looking at, you know, the, the statistical distribution of the data, learning how to encode, you know, these are, I assume, very basic things for everybody in this chat. Everybody's a lot more um, experienced than I am. But for me, you know, it was a, a neat way to learn how to encode the groups and the formations. I'm a process engineer, so I really don't know anything about subsurface. I care about anything above the ground, anything below the ground. I really don't care about as a process engineer, which is kind of funny, but you know, just, just doing these basic things and learning and failing as I went along. Learning how to impute, you know, so there was in the starter notebook talks about, you know, you should do certain 
imputations and all that. And I'll kind of go through that and what I did at the very end and just learning that, you know, if you shuffle the data a little bit, it, it, it can yield a better result. So there was a lot of beginner learning, but for someone like me, the starter notebook and the guides that are available in this kind of open source community really helped me a lot. Commenting. So as a beginner, there's a lot of times where I have no idea what I'm doing. So within the Jupyter notebooks or within some of my code, I would give myself reminders at least to know what was going on or what gave me a better or worse result. So sometimes there are things that I thought were going to be good in terms of influencing my final model, but it, it didn't work out because I would just try. Obviously sit in front of a computer, try twice a day because that's what you get. You know, let the computer run, go out, head to the beach, enjoy the, the sunshine in Australia. And so it was fun that way. And at the same time, I was able to give myself little hints as I go along. And I use this solution and this experience to go back and see what I did and apply it to future machine learning applications. So what weirdly worked here? So, you know, it's all about perspectives and I would talk to my colleagues. And so one of the things I learned was, you know, randomly was if even if I impute it with zeros, which was something the starter notebook said I shouldn't do, it gave me a better result. You know, I tried to impute based on um, uh, other libraries or looking at averages or looking at uh, somehow normalizing the data. It didn't work for me. I don't really know why and people more experienced can talk about that, but imputing with zeros worked a lot better for my code. You know, I use the coordinate data. I know there's been a lot of discussions on you know, using um, KNN to try and figure out graphically ge geography. And for me, that didn't work. But, you know, just plugging in X, Y, Z coordinates just made it better. And really, I didn't change too much from that starter notebook. And what worked was simple, you know, which is kind of the running theme at this uh, symposium right now. Simple was, was great for me learning wise and I guess great for the code because we're not overfitting the data. So, you know, as a newbie, I guess, and as an individual who is not in the geoscience world as much, I tried different things. And I guess that gave me an advantage because I just went, I don't know, I'm going to try everything. And certain things worked. I couldn't explain it 100%, but it gave me a different angle. And I said, hey, this worked. I'm going to play with it a little bit more here. So what didn't work? You know, there are a lot of failures. Each day I would sit in front of the computer submit twice a day and go, oh, yay, I did a, a really good job or no, this really did not work out for maybe. And making these mistakes and, and growing and learning as I as I went through it really helped me with that, you know, Bill, uh, I, you know, building a custom imputing loop for each well to try and impute it based on per well didn't work. You know, like I said, I had discussed previously certain variables that I thought would do well within my feature engineering review didn't pan out, you know, shuffling by well didn't yield a better result. I know there was another starter tutorial on the KNN for just graphically um, categorizing the wells based on their geography. Uh, I tried to incorporate that into my model and that didn't work as well. But you know, the, the failure there helped me grow in terms of learning about these different tools and machine learning applications. So improvements, you know, what could I have done better? Uh, use a classifier than the random forest. I think I used another one, but it didn't work out well. So I just stuck with what I knew as a beginner. Maybe better computer power with more hyperparameter tuning. I know at some points I would run out of memory or my computer couldn't handle it. So that kind of limited me to what I could do. I didn't really apply the custom scoring. It kind of gave me an indicator of what my score would be, but I didn't include that specifically in my uh, training model. I didn't venture into data augmentation. I know there's there were some talks earlier about that, and I had discussed with colleagues about implementing that, but I was still an amateur at that point. And, and I'm still new to kind of this particular industry, so. And obviously here, don't, I mean, sometimes I would save, I, I don't know how other people do it. Obviously I save a million different Jupyter notebooks, can get confusing. Um, sometimes I don't know which one I ran to get me the best score. So 
maybe don't do that. I know if you're more into the data world, there's a better way of doing it. You can use Git and all that. But as an amateur, you would just save it as like a, a Rev 2A, you know, and I, I know it's hilarious, but uh, that's how I did it at the beginning. So, and the rankings, you know, it's really funny because only top 15 and 20 were supposed to make it for the scoring. Obviously, they didn't qualify for that. And I think with such a close scoring, the organizers expanded to 30. And technically, I still didn't make the cut, but I was asked to do it because I was placed number 31. I said, sure, you know, why not? And I ended up placing top 10, probably because it was a very general, um, non-overfitted model. And it was very simple, in my opinion. Um, I also noticed, you know, there are tons of teams, you know, lots of solutions, uh, lots of uh, submissions were based on, I guess, who the the uh, event organizers had invited, but my understanding or my assumption is that sometimes you didn't submit your code properly or you didn't follow the instructions. So I learned, you know, you could have the greatest code in the world, but if you don't follow the instructions of the competition, sometimes you might not be able to get it. So that might be a little fluke or a little bit of luck that I stumbled into the top 10 ranking, but you know, that really gave me the motivation to really appreciate machine learning and data science in general. So what am I doing after? You know, I, I know it's interesting to just show you kind of my beginner stuff, but I'm doing random stuff on the side, participating in more non-charity stuff like Data for Good in Canada and doing their marathons. I mentor some individuals and I'm going to be participating in some of the geothermal data thons and hackathons that are going to be held virtually. So that really uh, motivates me. I did try another machine learning with the SPE Gulf Coast in the US and I didn't do well. I kind of used the same philosophy there, but it didn't apply from transitioning from this competition to the other one, but it was still fun. I still was learning a lot in in how to do it and and that's it. So, you know, kind of final thoughts are that, you know, the open source communities, particularly in the subsurface world, is actually fantastic. You know, Software Underground, um, their Slack channel, just tons of resources, tons of helpful people. I know they just had a conference there, so lots of great feedback from, from there. And it was a great learning challenge. And I treat it more as a, a game or as a motivation rather than taking it too seriously. And that really helped in terms of just having fun with it, you know. But uh, as an amateur, as an individual, as a process engineer, the, the ML world has really opened new perspectives and opportunities, at least in my opinion. And it's really picked up, I would say, uh, particularly during the pandemic. So I'm, I'm really thankful that this uh, happened, you know, and, and it's kind of weird to say, but if the pandemic didn't happen, uh, I don't know if this particular event would have been set up the way that it was. And it gave me the opportunity to explore the world of ML. So that's really my presentation. And thank you very much for listening. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's nice to have such a personal story. You know, I'm I'm still sort of there where I should take your journey and should just sit down and start coding <laughs> instead of just reading about it and getting everybody else to code. So there anybody who wants to say something to Jeremy or has some qu uh, questions or something to add here? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. That was a, I really enjoyed this presentation. I mean, uh, I, I was the one that uh, wrote this uh, this uh, starter notebook, so um, I was really interested to hear your. <laughs> it was interesting to hear your experiences with it. I mean, I made a, a several projections in this notebook uh, on what would probably work and what wouldn't and uh, most of them uh, turn out to be ultimately incorrect right i mean uh, i i expect that the winners of this competition would be those who figured out really clever ways to impute missing logs or take advantage of partial information in a clever way and i also projected that the winners would be the ones that were able to optimize for these this geologically motivated scoring matrix and and it turns out, I mean, that's uh, that was not the case at all. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are teams to, who did that, and I, I know teams that did, did that, but uh, 
it was not uh, so so they, you put this uh, this guesswork into the starter notebook to prime people and then uh, i'm glad people didn't uh, go crazy with it uh, and went with what worked instead <laughs> in a way yeah i think you know just submitting and trying at least on my end right was was the first step in learning right you know you don't you don't get anywhere if you don't try at all. So I said, hey, you know, this starter notebook was fantastic. You know, it outlined the steps very well. And there were other starter notebooks as well with the, the KNN tutorial that I went through. So, you know, my lessons learned from here was simple was best. It treated me very well as a beginner. And um, I guess, unfortunately, it kind of threw the common sense or what you thought should have happened out the door because Beginners like me were just trying everything and I guess everything else besides what you had thought worked. So that was actually kind of fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know, it's a general topic here that we when we all when we in the run up to the competition we had all sorts of pin opinions on how to solve that problem and many of them didn't become true so that's a good lesson for us as well um, yeah. we also expected that this would require deep geological knowledge to actually be able to compete uh, mm -hmm. on top of that that was also didn't necessarily uh, <laughs> turn out to be true in all cases at least right no and it, it is still to my great disappointment as you understand <laughs> that that's not the case so i'm still hopeful that somebody with deep geological knowledge is going to come up with an amazing score one day okay uh, we'll move on to the last talk here from timor um also talking about he's going to use a wave flare transformation and machine learning to predict lithofascies timor are you there uh, Reza wants to ask a question. I Hello. Just yeah. Yes. Uh, can Hi, I ask a question uh, from Jeremy yeah. or? Yes, please go ahead, Reza. We have a bit extra time. Sorry, Timo. I just put yeah. you and wait here. Yeah. Yeah, but I have a question about the, I mean, imputation of the missing data. Is it uh, most of the data is from the, some specific class that they are? I mean, they have the missing data or not? Because I mean, when you put the zeros. And then with decision-based uh, methods, I mean decision tree-based methods, uh, you can easily get those uh, labels correctly. For example, if you add zero, you can get uh, those classes uh, easily classified, and then maybe that's the reason or not. Well, you know, it's it's an interesting question because you know, even as a process engineer, you go, hey, if there's something that's missing or something that's an outlier, you know, if we were to regress it or to put an average in there that would be more representative of that lithology. But, you know, be, as an amateur, I just went, I'm just going to put zero because that worked. And so I, I you know, I'm still an amateur, so I, I can't completely answer the question, but logic would have it that, you know, if there's some kind of relationship, the zeros shouldn't have made the result better, but it did. And so we just kept that going forward and that's kind of where i branched off and i just said i'm going to keep those zeros for my uh, null values and then just work trying to fine tune my um the the random forest regress uh, classifier that i was working on so it's i'm not an i'm not by any means an expert to answer that question but logic didn't work out for me when i was saying i'm just going to impede it with zero and you know maybe maybe the, the two Peters here have a, have a better answer to that, to be honest. Thanks. I, I don't have a better answer for sure, but maybe Peter has. 